I entitled it Zales Orger. Martin Luther's reform of pastoral care. As you all know, Zelsorge is a uh, is the German word for uh, really a translation of uh, cura animarum, the care of souls. And as a as a German phrase, it really is coined by Luther. Uh, before Luther uses Seelsorge in the way that he uses it, it actually has a, diff a very different meaning in the German language. It usually means like official testimony or witness or something like that. Um, so Luther actually brings this German word into theological language based on the tradition of, uh, of cure of souls. And, um, and he connects it with, for instance, the uh, end of Hebrews where uh, Jesus is called the uh, bishop Episcopus, the bishop of our souls. Um, just what I'd like to do for the next couple of sessions, I'm going to start off by giving just a little bit of uh, introduction in terms of the literature. I'm going to talk about the perspective of pastoral care as a lens through which to understand the whole Reformation movement. We'll look at a little bit of the background, medieval and uh, late medieval and Luther's own context for pastoral care. Um, and then we'll also talk about the concrete ways in which he carries this out. Um, but I'd like, even though I have sort of a structure uh, where I'd like to go, I'd also like to be flexible enough to work with the kinds of questions you have as we go through. So I'm not going to have a designated Q&A time at the end. Uh, I'm going to stop uh, regularly throughout and invite any questions or comments that you have. And feel free to raise your hand even and, and uh, have a more dialogical. This is a smaller group, which has pluses and minuses. The big plus is uh, we get to conduct ourselves a little bit more seminar oriented. And, and that's, I think, my favorite format anyway. Um, so uh, just so that you're familiar, in case you're interested in further readings on the topic, um, the probably the most important book on Luther's uh, work of pastoral care is from Gerhard Abeling. This is the last book Gerhard Abeling wrote uh, before he died, uh, Luther's Seelsorge. Uh, it looks at Luther's understanding of pastoral care and his reform of pastoral care through his letters. So the letters are the primary uh, texts that he works with. When I teach a course on uh, Luther as pastoral theologian, um, an enormous amount of time with the students is spent in reading uh, Luther's letters because it's not just theoretical but very concrete expressions of how he uh, how he uh, brings theology to bear in people's lives. Um, so this is probably your your starting point. Obviously, if 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 you uh, are not reading German. Um, then you'll have to enter in elsewhere. Uh, you may be familiar with uh, these two texts. Um, they were by, put out some years ago by Lutheran Quarterly Books, and they're really collections of essays that were published by Lutheran Quarterly and then brought uh, together in two volumes. So you can find it in a couple different venues. But The Pastoral Luther and Harvesting Martin Luther's Reflections on Theology, Ethics, and the Church, um, a lot of the essays have to do with uh, various facets of Luther's pastoral care or the pastoral effect uh, of Luther's reform. And it embraces things like catechesis as well and liturgical reforms and all of those things. In other words, the, uh, what I, one of the things I want to get across today is that when I'm talking about pastoral care, this is not the reform of a specific um, narrow doctrine or facet of the church. It's a uh, framework to understand the majority of Luther's reform activity. Um, so it embraces things like the reform of worship, uh, catechesis, art, all of those sorts of things. Um, and then also, uh, I mentioned Luther's letters, and you're probably all familiar with this. Um, Theodore Tappert's collection of letters, Letters of Spiritual Counsel. What's very helpful about that collection is it's organized thematically. So you have, rather than chronologically, so you have a, a section of Luther's letters to those who are um, sick. Then you have a section of letters to those who have are bereaved or have lost a loved one, those who are anxious or worried about their salvation. And so you can read thematically through his writings and see, you can ask all sorts of questions uh, of Luther's pastoral care uh, given that structure. For instance, um, what are his favorite Bible passages that he uses in uh, caring for those who are sick or those who have lost a loved one? Um, where, does he have a set of go-to passages, which short answer is yes, he does. Uh, like a lot of us do. Um, what's his general approach? Is there a consistent approach in his letter writing um, when, he, when he's trying to comfort those in need and 
so that, that's a, a helpful text. Um, and in fact, it's a text that I can, I've read just devotionally, just sitting down and reading Luther's letters um, to people that are suffering. Uh, has been uh, personally edifying. And then uh, John Pless, uh, a few years ago, published um, a study on Luther's uh, pastoral theology, which comes out of his teaching at the seminary uh, and in Fort Wayne, and in many ways takes a lot of the categories that those earlier books that you saw from Lutheran Quarterly um, and sort of expounds on them in, in his text. So um, uh, Pless has been spending many years on on Luther's pastoral theology as well. Um, when we think of the Reformation, uh, of course, here's all these you know, dramatic paintings of what happened 500 years ago. Luther nailing the 95 Theses to the door. Um, there he is burning the papal bull um, or standing uh, before emperor and bishop at the Diet of Worms, and all of those are, uh, are important events. But I think um, we forget sometimes the context in which it originally happens, because we have, uh, you know, the hindsight is twenty twenty. Luther's not working with the idea that what's happening there on the, on the far left is a big deal, right? I mean, first of all, there's even debate whether he nailed it to the door. Um, but regardless, if he nailed it to the door or didn't, uh, it's Wittenberg, right? Who's been to Wittenberg? Anyone been to Wittenberg? It's like uh, two streets in a stoplight. I mean, it's, it's, you still pretty much exhaust the town in, in a couple of days today. And back then, there was even less. Here, you're on the edge of the empire, and what Luther does at a church door in Wittenberg means nothing unless something happens from that. It's printed, it's distributed, um, it's translated into a language people can understand. And all of those things, many of those things happened without Luther's permission or knowledge. Um, so Luther thought uh, nailing the 95 Theses to the door was an important step, but not the step that was going to reform the whole church and certainly not strike a match that caused uh, the kinds of things that did happen. But we'll come back to that because um, why I think it's still a significant event, not just because it's the moment when Luther became public, uh, famous, and infamous, um, but it also does, I think, correctly uh, encapsulate what is at stake for Luther. Um, the nailing of the 95 Theses to the door, the whole dispute about indulgences is a pastoral care dispute. Okay? Um, but again, uh, when trying to imagine what the Reformation is about, is it about the doctrine of justification? Is it about the Lord's Supper? Is it about the distinction of long gospel? It's about all of those things. Um, but Luther isn't out to discover a particular doctrine, uh, or he, he's, he's out to, well, we'll talk about this. He has a, a perspective on uh, what his calling and his vocation is. Uh, and as you all know, of course, that Luther isn't out to start a new church. Um, but even more so, his approach to the whole theological problem uh, comes from the vantage point of pastoral care. Um, so keeping that in mind, Jane Stroll, uh, a Reformation scholar out in, in um, Berkeley, I guess, she wrote, one could describe Luther's career as the mounting of a lifelong pastoral malpractice suit against the church's authority at every level of the hierarchy. Uh, and in many ways, this is, this is kind of the perspective I want us to, to look at, and the kinds of questions we're going to uh, deal with today are taking that perspective seriously. Now, what does pastoral care mean, or what's the goal of pastoral care? Um, so first, I'm just going to lead with how I understand Luther, Luther's goal of pastoral care, and then we'll back up a bit and talk about um, how people understood pastoral care in Luther's day and then kind of back our way back into it. So uh, this is not a Luther quote. This is just my summary of what I think the whole thing's sort of about for Luther. The, this is the litmus test by which you evaluate a practice or a doctrine. This is, the, this is the, the touchstone by which Luther, that animates Luther's actual concrete reforms. Um, the goal is the absolute saturation of the word of Christ into the lives and hearts of people. It is the clinging 
to the one thing needful throughout life lived and at life's end. Um, so the measure, the standard by which Luther uh, carries out his reforming work is, is the saturation of Christ's word in the lives of people, um, preparing them for shaping their way they live and also shaping the way and the faith and hope in which they die. Um, and this also distinguishes Luther from the other reformers. I think when you look at the second generation of reformers, a lot of them are are animated by a different vision of what it means to reform the church. To go back to some pristine time in which the church was uh, more apostolic. Uh, the idea is that uh, you had this kind of moment of golden clarity, and of course a lot of the reformers were humanists first, so the idea of going ad fontis back to the sources was deeply important for the Reformation movement. But a lot of them took that as, the, as really the, the center of the program. Find that golden era of the church. Recognize that in between now and the golden era, there's all sorts of dross that has happened that needs now to be stripped away and purged. And we need to find uh, where in that, you know, there's a debate then, kind of where is that golden era? So for Calvinism, of course, they find the whole structure of the church um, in the scriptures themselves, and that everything that intervenes in between tends to be uh, either a clouding of scripture or an adding to scripture. Luther's not working with that primary paradigm. That he's, he's not trying to find a pure apostolic, biblical-shaped Christianity with the assumption that everything in between has been a corruption. Um, rather, he's working with this as the goal, and anything that has happened in the history of the church, doctrine or practice, that does this is fine. And anything that steers us away from this, diverts us, clouds us, confuses us, those are the objects of Luther's reform. That's what makes Luther's reform, you know, often it's talked about the conservative reformation. But it's not because Luther is kind of emotionally or politically or ideologically conservative. Uh, it's because he has a very different aim uh, than a lot of the other reformations that we see as radical reformations or reformed reformations. Um, and so he's, he's not looking for, he doesn't have this view of, of the church that there is a, like, like the Donatists, that there's this moment when everything is sort of perfect and we just got to get back to that. Um, instead, all we have is a very clear effect of Christ's word and we need to uh, make sure that whatever we do and say and practice is aimed at that. Does that make sense? Um, so just two facets of that now. What does that look like, uh, being saturated with the word of Christ? And again, these are things that you're familiar with, but um, it's a certain uh, perspective ask, on that. Can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. So you're, you are saying that, um, and I, I, I think that I agree with you, that Luther's main concern was basically practical as, a, as opposed to academic or intellectual. Practical well, in the sense of this is how we should live our lives to the end that we get. Um, yeah, I think the, the the opposition of of theology and practice, or um, uh, what goes on in the lecture hall versus what happens in the pulpit, is much more accentuated today post post enlightenment. Now it's a problem in Luther's day too. I mean, there's a lot of criticism of a certain scholastic theology that's disconnected from what happens in the life of the church. Um, but Luther is quite intentional about what he does at the university should have impact upon what happens in the daily lives of people. So it is a comprehensive view of things. Does that I, make sense? I don't, I don't mean to say that it's a dichotomy. I mean, I mean like, after all, look at us. Um, uh, we, we, are, we are products of, of a very highly intellectual academic system, and yet we are thrown into the trenches here in Southern District. So. Um, I mean, we'll, we'll come back to this in terms of uh, the relationship of pastoral care and theology. And that's, I mean, this is a good point. But the, the short answer to your question is, yes, Luther sees these things as the telos is uh, not a great commentary on systematic theology. The telos is the individual's faith that sustains them on their deathbed. Now, uh, there's a couple of ways to look at this. I mean, this is uh, faith and love justification and, and its implications for, for life. Uh, Luther's 
One of Luther's favorite ways of describing um, the effects of Christ's word upon us is to talk about the union that we have with Christ, the connection that we have with Christ. He uses uh, bridal mystical language, uh, again, which is you know, part of the tradition. Um, it's the basis by which he uses what we, we call the, the fröhliche Wechsel, the, the happy exchange. Um, and this is a quote from the uh, uh, 1520 treatise, The Freedom of the Christian. Faith unites the soul with Christ as a bride is united with her bridegroom Christ and the soul become one flesh. And so um, the importance of, uh, I mean, this is, this is the context in which justification is taught, etc. The importance that our entire life, our entire identity, our entire present and our entire future is determined by our connection to Christ. Um, which, of course, first begins in baptism in Romans 6, um, but continues to be sustained uh, through the word of Christ. Uh, this is the, the central thesis for Luther, right? And, of course, the happy exchange is, uh, you, you know, you, you get married um, and you inherit all sorts of things from your spouse. My students know that they, uh, the, they inherit their, their spouse's student debt. Um, and that's the, that's the image that Luther uses, too. That when they are joined together, the two become one flesh, and the properties in which they have are shared so that Christ gets our debt, right? He gets our sin, and we receive his righteousness and life. Um, and that exchange is uh, not the only way, but one of Luther's um, favorite ways to describe what actually happens uh, in justification by faith. And then the, the second is um, pastoral care. So pastoral care is about aiming at connecting the believer to Christ through his word by faith alone. Um, but of course, uh, not only is faith never alone, but um, no one is saved alone. In other words, this is, we, we, need, we need an Alabama slash Tennessee translation of the Bible to sort our theology correctly because um, we need the this is for y'all to kind of drive our theology. There's most of the second person pronouns in the scriptures are, are plural. And that, that Christ <coughs> connecting this to us, uh, you know, we, we sometimes talk about ourselves as being temples of the Holy Spirit. And while that's true, Paul speaking, of course, of the church as a temple of the Holy Spirit. He says, you are temples of the Holy Spirit. And that's y'all are temples of the Holy Spirit. Um, rather than a bunch of individual people, all this sort of uh, uh, temples themselves. So uh, Luther understands, and of course, we need to accentuate this a bit more in our individualistic context in America um, that salvation is into a community into a church into a body that exists before you show up you are baptized into a body with a pre-existing ethic and life the bride the church but of course when you are connected to Christ then your relationship to others is to actually be that be that Christ for them uh, so this is a very poignant uh, passage, which I think comes from a letter from uh, to, to Frederick. Uh, the virgin must place her wreath upon a prostitute. A virtuous wife must give her veil to an adulteress, and we must let everything we have be a covering for the sinner. I will therefore give myself as a Christ to my neighbor, just as Christ offered himself to me. This This absolute self-sacrifice the, the law of Christ according to, to Galatians 6 is to bear one another's burdens right? to bear one another's sins um, to live uh, as uh, you know this is, the, this is the mandatum right on Monday Thursday love one another as I have loved you uh, the giving of myself as Christ as a Christ to the neighbor comments or questions just on this this is a, obviously a very brief summary, but these, I'm trying to highlight the things for Luther that, that tend to be really important in his language when he's talking about the goal of pastoral care. Yeah. The, the second quote here, that's a Luther quote as well? Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, I think it, it's a 15, 18, or 19 letter to, uh, or dedicatory letter to uh, Frederick.
All right. So that's the perspective. That's the lens. Let's just keep that in mind. Um, now we're going to kind of back ourselves up a little bit um, and talk a little bit about the, the history of Quran Amarum, of uh, care of souls, and what that entails, especially in the, in the late Middle Ages. Um, there are sort of two main facets of pastoral care in Luther's day and in the, in the centuries before. Um, the first is priestly. In other words, this is, the, this, is the, this is how the church, through its priesthood, uh, deals with consciences that are bound by sin, um, brings a sense of hope and certainty in the, in the midst of anxiety uh, about one's salvation. In other words, it's the formal priestly acts that are dealing with uh, sin and the destiny of the soul. And there are three main ones that are predominate uh, in Luther's day. Um, the first is the sacrament of penance and confession. Um, so the sacrament of penance is the means, the priestly means by which, uh, by which the church deals with consciences and sin. And, of, and actually, this is a fairly recent phenomenon. Um, remember, penance is something, if you go all the way back in, in history, penance is something that is the What's Jerome, Jerome's phrase? Are you familiar with Jerome's phrase? So what, what penance is? The last plank on a sinking ship. Right. What does that mean? That penance is the last plank on a sinking ship. It grows out of this larger early church question of what does one do with post-baptismal sin? If someone, uh, since baptism is for the forgiveness of sins, if someone commits a sin... Wherein lies forgiveness? Um, and that, that question, and of course, when they're thinking of sin in the early church, they're not thinking about like coveting my neighbor's cookie sin. Um, they're thinking of gross external sins like apostasy, a murder. And apostasy, of course, is where this question becomes pointed because it's in the midst of persecution and after the persecution wanes, you have people who have actually sacrificed to the emperor or made, their, made the vows to the emperor and renounced their faith. And then after that passes, they want to be brought back into the church and the church is wondering, well, what, I can't baptize. You've already been baptized. You've denied our Lord. Do we even have the authority to bring you back into the church? And that question, um, I mean, you can see that even in the Epistle to the Hebrews in, in chapter 6. There's this sentiment that uh, once you've tasted uh, of the Lord, you cannot re-crucify him, right? You can't, what, what, what can one do afterwards once you've denied him? Um, and one of the most popular uh, texts in the early church that addressed this question directly was the Shepherd of Hermas. Shepherd of Hermas almost uh, was, was in some of the canonical lists. But the, uh, the essential thesis of the Shepherd of Hermas is this question. What does one do after post-baptismal sin? And it was a revelation of an angel that said, uh, though uh, there is no repentance after baptism, uh, the Lord will give a, uh, a dispensation. You get, you get a mulligan, right? One. And that mulligan is penance, lifelong penance. And to be a penitent is not uh, going to the sac, you know, not uh, 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 going like we see in, in modern day Catholicism to a, a confessional and, and finding out what kind of, uh, how many Hail Marys I have to do. Penance is you enroll as a penitent. And this is a, you don't want to do this. This is a lifelong um, uh, 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 enrollment. And you're finally brought in full communion to the church on your deathbed through the Eucharist. Uh, and so, and this is why people are advising, why there's this tendency in the early church to delay one's baptism. You want to, Tertullian says, at least, you know, wait through, you get through puberty. You want to play that ace strategically. Because um, you know you're going to screw up when you're 16. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, this is this general practice all the way into the 4th century of delaying one's baptism because of this, this question of, of post-baptismal sin. Um, so, uh, what's interesting, though, is after the, after the conversion of Constantine and Christianity uh, becomes legal and martyrdom and persecution isn't the, the primary experience of the church, um, monasticism takes on the mantle of the penitent. Part of the identity of, of the monk is that they live as spiritual penitents. Um, and their practice, you all know Compline, of course, and the confession in Compline 
there that I have sinned by my fault, my own fault, my own most grievous fault, grows out of that monastic mutual, actually this is what the mutual consolation of the brethren actually means in the small called articles. People don't even, they cite this all over the place, but it's mutual consolation of the brethren is rooted in this monastic practice of the, it's a means of grace, right? It's this absolution back and forth. And so, um, uh, that practice of being a penitent, confessing one's sins to one another, um, receiving mutual absolution, um, eventually becomes uh, spread out to the wider church. Um, well, let me answer your question first and we'll go. Yeah. I do. I, I'd like you to open up that just a little bit further because this, this is, again, I lack the knowledge completely right. on this idea that, that the mutual consolation and conversation flows out of the monastic right. understanding. Could, could you back up on that again? That, that was really... Yeah, and, and, and I'll, I'll touch on it a couple of different points, but I think, first of all, um, when Luther uses the word the brethren, um, it, there's two ways in which this could be understood, right? It could be like in the biblical sense of brothers and, and then sisters in Christ, right? The, the brethren. Um, but then there's also the, Luther is a brother. He is a frater, right? And a lot of, especially his early writings, when he's talking about the brethren, is, is, is using language that grows out of the monastic experience that then is sort of exported beyond the monastic boundaries. Exactly. Actually, this is a key uh, part of the thesis uh, today, is the relation, part of Luther's um, approach to pastoral care is an extension of many of the ideals of monastic mystical piety to embrace the entire uh, Christendom. And so um, when Luther says that the, that the mutual consolation of the brethren and conversation of the brethren is one of the means of grace, that's echoing the, the monastic experience of penance and absolution, um, which is now extended to all Christians in the sense that we all, uh, you know, when he talks about penance and about the ability of all believers to absolve one another, et cetera, it grows out, it grows out of that. Does that make sense? Yeah. And we, we, yeah, we can come back to that when we, we get to that it point. Is, it, 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 it's the ability to share the gospel between the priesthood. I mean, but it comes out of this monastic period. You know, where you look at the mutual conversation and consolation, mm -hmm. it is because the gospel is able to be proclaimed on a priestly individual level, and absolution is able to be received from a brother in Christ, a mutually right. baptized saint. Right. Um, it's, it, but, it, but it's a redefinition of priestly, and it's also a redefinition of what it means to be religious. Um, so, uh, well, well, please, let's come back to this, because you're, you're, you're touching on a, a key point that we need, to, we need to clarify throughout here. So, thank you very much. Um, the... Uh, uh, so this this ex monastic experience of of the of the uh, uh, of being a penitent um, eventually becomes um, mandatory for all Christians, and this is the tendency of monasticism is to claim that they are authentic Christians and that all Christians should actually emulate them, right? Because um, why join monasticism if you didn't think this was actually what one ought to do? And, and, um, and so monasticism is this interesting tension. It's, on the one hand, a conscience to the church calling them out of mediocrity. On the other hand, it's a tension with the institutional church because you're always seeming to do an end run around the, the main structures that are there. Um, and so uh, uh, you see the influence of monasticism reaching out beyond its walls to try to influence the rest of Christianity. The Cluniac reforms are a good example of this in the ninth century where you have the... Uh, the vow of celibacy is now extended to the clergy. So remember, the vow of celibacy is not a priestly, clerical vow. It is a monastic, religious vow, but it's then extended at that point. And in the same way, at the Fourth Lateran Council, um, there is the prerequisite for all Christians to participate in penance at least once a year. Um, 
And it's at that point that the whole penitential, sacramental penitential system changes and explodes, and there's all these handbooks on what to do with it, the whole system of uh, uh, contrition, confession, satisfaction, all of that is a working out of this sort of bleeding of monastic piety as a prerequisite for all Christians. So that's 1204, Fourth Lateran Council. Um, and in, in that intervening time, penance becomes one of the dominant ways in which the priests then affect every lay Christian with respect to sin uh, and, uh, and, and comforting consciences. And it, it is a central place in Luther's own reformatory struggles. We'll come back to that. The second one is indulgences. So by the time you get uh, to the late Middle Ages, indulgences is actually just another pastoral care tool to deal with people's past sins. Um, and there's a development in the theology of indulgences. It's a fairly recent uh, development from Luther's perspective. And uh, interestingly, cancels out the effect of penance. Um, so if penance is about trying to have you reflect upon your own failings and confess them and divulge them uh, to to create a state of contrition, which of course is very much a monastic uh, uh, ideal, indulgences prevents it, right? You don't have to feel sorry for sin, you just have to pay for a piece of paper. When you read the 95 Theses with that in mind, you start to realize what, what tr is driving Luther crazy about this. What's the first thesis? When, Luther's, when, Jesus, when our Lord Jesus says, penitentium agata, He's not saying, go do the sacrament of penance. And he certainly isn't saying, go do indulgences. He's saying, let the whole life be a life of repentance. Right. And now, how do the indulgences fit into that goal? Um, that's part of the concern. And then the third uh, priestly act is, uh, uh, is the private mass. And again, I think if you just attend to this, Luther's earliest criticisms of the church, public criticisms of the church in his earlier writings, are focused directly on these three things. He has an enormous amount of work that he writes on the sacrament of penance that culminates finally in the uh, 1520 treatise on Babylonian captivity. Of course, the indulgences is this huge thing from 1517 on until his excommunication. And the private mass... Um, is, is the great abomination in the Babylonian captivity, right? And it's the thing that, it's the thread that runs all the way through to the Augsburg Confession, where the three things that are the, the reform, you know, the Augsburg Confession, the first section of it is all about establishing our Catholicity, and the last bit are the controverted issues, and there's three. Three things that we've reintroduced, we admit, we've reintroduced, but we think they're biblical, and that is uh, marriage of priests, communion of both kinds, and the abolition of the sacrifice of the Mass. And uh, the response of the opponents eventually uh, was, well, we'll give you, we'll give you communion of both kinds and we'll give you marriage of priests, but you can't get rid of, can't get rid of the Mass. Um, and at that point it was too late. Wine and women were not bribery enough to, to bring us around. Um, but so these are, these are central issues in the Reformation. Um, but then there's non-priestly, and I think we have to, we have to uh, be aware that there are developments in the late Middle Ages, especially cultivating um, piety that are without, outside the parameters of the official sacerdotal, sacramental structure. Um, laity are hungry for uh, spiritual growth and their own uh, ability to console their consciences. And... Well, I, I'll get down a rabbit hole in a minute here, but uh, I'll, let me just list these. So, obviously, um, there's a couple of ways in which this happens. Uh, we're still dealing with a population that's largely illiterate, but it's a growing literate population. And especially in the cities, the literate become kind of the catalyst for, for, for perpetuating a variety of devotional materials. Sermons being published on topics. Um, remember, Preaching is not a priestly act in the late Middle Ages. It's not a central act of the divine service. That's the sacrifice of the Mass. Um, actually, some of the most popular preachers are not priests, but they're monks or mendicants, um, which, which is a threat again. People come to hear the sermons of, 
of these non-priests, and they would rather actually get absolution from a guy who preaches a good sermon than a priest who can't do any theology. And of course, he doesn't have the authority to do penance, but he has moral authority over the people, but not official sacerdotal authority. But sermons and, and um, the publication of sermons, the reading, public reading of sermons, Johann von Staupitz is a very popular preacher, for example, in Nuremberg. They have a group of people called the Soldatus Staupitzianus, that we are the soldiers of Staupitz. They're just a fan club. And they just publish all of his sermons, and they invite him down to do conferences of the, the confessional Nurembergers, and, 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 uh, and they listen to him. And, and, he's, he, and so um, that's a common thing. But other texts, too, Ars Moriendi in the late Middle Ages becomes a very popular genre of devotional literature, the art of dying, or how to prepare one for oneself for death. Uh, 14 consolations literature uh, grows out of a vision in the 15th century by a Franconian shepherd who evidently sees these 14 different saints appear to him, and it's revealed to them that each saint uh, has the power over a particular ailment, right? If you pray to this saint, you get rid of gout. If you pray to this saint, you, you, you know, toothache goes away. And, and that, that vision then becomes a source of a whole bunch of literature and devotional practices that entail invocation to the saints. But you can see paintings in the late Middle Ages that features the 14 saints. You can see uh, altar pieces that have them all in little alcoves, but it becomes a very popular piece of literature. Um, meditations on the Passion of Christ. Again, in the late Middle Ages, um, meditations on the Passion of Christ are an extremely popular uh, uh, devotional text and um, means by which uh, one's spiritual development is, is fostered outside of the priestly, a formal priestly uh, uh, office. And then Legenda Aurea, or the, uh, the legends of the saints, the golden legends, um, books about the miracles of the saints and the lives of the saints literature, extremely popular uh, in the late Middle Ages. Um, Luther calls all of these things, he calls all of these things Geistlichkeiten. Um, and he usually, when he uses the word Geistlichkeiten, he usually means he's, it's negative because he's referring to these practices that need to be reformed. <clears throat> Geistlichkeiten just, well, I mean, literally you can say spiritualities. But it, it's really uh, religious and devotional practices. That's what these Geistlichkeiten are, everything we were listing there. <clears throat> and if you look at Luther's reforming activity from the, early, from the beginning, you see that what he's publishing is directly aimed at all of these practices. Um, so 1517, of course, we have the, the indulgences in his Sermon on Indulgences. He writes, uh, he also publishes uh, a, a translation and a little commentary on the seven penitential psalms, which immediately starts to shape the way in which one thinks about the sacrament of penance. In 1518, he publishes a devotional text called the Theologia Deutsch, the German theology, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. 1519, he publishes a sermon on the sacrament of penance, also on the blessed sacrament of the body of Christ. He also writes his own version of the 14 consolations literature. He also writes his own version of the Ars of Moriendi, the sermon on preparing to die. Um, he also writes a meditation, uh, I think in 15... 1519, a meditation on the Passion of Christ, a sermon there as well. 1520, he takes up the question of the Mass and penance again um, with the Babylonian captivity as he redefines the sacraments. 1522, of course, the German New Testament is a translation, but it's intended as uh, for uh, not just for priests and not just for monks. It is a text for the laity in their own language with his own FAQs and uh, introductions and marginal notes along the way. Um, and of course, if, if we keep in mind that Luther understands the goal of pastoral care as saturation with the word of Christ, saturation with the word of God, um, then you can see what the primary central devotional text is going to be for Luther, which is, the, this is going to be the scriptures themselves. And so the most the central project, the central work of Luther's reforming activity is the translation of the scriptures into German um, and all that accompanies that. He reforms the lives of saints literature, believe it or not, with the German Psalms. Uh, and I'll, 
in the second half this afternoon, I'll, I'll share some examples of this, but Luther actually positions his German translation of the Psalter in the preface as a replacement of the Lives of the Saints literature. Um, and then, of course, on and on, you know, reforming of the Mass, all of those things are aimed at, at reshaping what are the most popular dominant devotional practices, um, reshaping them so that they aim at the, at the central doctrine of the church, the doctrine of Christ who comes to us by faith. Um, so he doesn't get rid of the practices as much as he reshapes them, um, grabs hold of the things that people are already engaged in and reorients them uh, to the central. You see, none of these practices are things that the Reformed Church do. Um, they just they abolish them because they've, they've developed at some point in the Middle Ages and they're not part of the, of the pristine church. But Luther takes all of them, some of them which are only maybe 100 years old, and uh, gives you kind of a, a gospel version of this, right? And in the afternoon, we'll, we'll go through some of these. We won't go through all of them, but I'll go through as an example to show what, Luther, what the old ones did and what Luther actually does with them. But, yeah. uh, as you're talking about th things that developed during the Middle Ages to help with the pastoral care of souls, I, I can't help to think of the Stations of the Cross. And, and do you have anything to, and how, how does that fit into the mm. things which developed? And I've never heard Luther really speak of it. Too much. I've so that that grows out of, and we will look at this, the, this meditation on Christ's passion genre literature. Um, there's a certain way in which the passion of Christ is meditated on and expounded, and there's a certain goal. And Luther um, is critical of that and offers a different path. Um, so if you want the modern example of meditation on the Passion of Christ literature genre of the, of the late Middle Ages, it's Mel Gibson. Absolutely. Mel Gibson's Passion of Christ is Meditationis de Passionis Christi of, of the late Middle Ages. You're talking about the movie. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Um, the, the, what it does visually is precisely what that literature does descriptively. And what it's intended to do uh, to the hearer and what you're supposed to reflect upon uh, is precisely the kind of stuff that the late Middle Ages. I, I haven't seen the movie. I mean, I read the book, uh, but get it? See, I read the book. Okay. Uh, but um, I haven't seen the movie, but, I, but I, I've seen enough to know exactly what, what, what's, what it's trying to do. Um, and Luther has a different approach. So the, the, back to your point, the... the uh, um, stages of the cross are part of that larger genre. Of, now, can, can, you, can you Lutheranize it? Of course, uh, and, and we have. In fact, we've Lutheranized most Lutherans and Protestants that watch the meditation, uh, the, the Passion of Christ, did a Protestant thing to it in their own head, right? Um, but Catholics who watched Mel Gibson knew exactly what this was about, and they viewed it very differently than the way the Protestants viewed it. Yeah. So how would you, um, how would you place uh, J uh, John Gerhardt's uh, book on, on the meditations of the passion of, of our Lord in, in in the Lutheran tradition? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I mean, when we look at when we look at Luther's uh, sermon. So if we look at Gerhardt as the basically the product of the interaction between this and and Luther. Yeah, I mean, he's working with an, Yeah, exactly right. Um, yeah, it has a, Gerhardt's Meditations of Christ is, is very much aimed at the, at the same kinds of goals that Luther's revision of it is aimed at. Other questions or comments? You've, you've mentioned uh, conscience. So, so the goal, I'm, I'm just seeing a very basic confusion of law and gospel. For people, I guess, I guess, trying to clear their conscience uh, with this uh, penance or indulgences or whatever, right? You know, even even what private confession was, um, you know, going to the priest, confessing your sins, and been given these things to do, or buy this indulgence, and this will clear your conscience, rather than a, a simple declaration of the forgiveness of sins. So 
are, are people, you know, in, in the Middle Ages, I guess, um, trying to achieve a clear conscience with the law rather than the gospel. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, the, sh the short I mean, Luther dubs this kind of religion, this kind of Geislichkeiten as, as works, righteousness, piety, right? That's his way of describing what's going on, which is, as you, as you noted, sort of works. But, you know, what's interesting is we, law in its generalissimus, the, the, in a more general sense, not the, the problem isn't that they're obeying the Decalogue too much. The problem is that they're, they're doing works, papistic works, um, in ways to uh, in ways to console the conscience, and so a lot like you're you're right, and I'm not <clears throat> I'm assuming you understand the distinction of law and gospel, and that's sort of key to this. Um, so when Luther is reforming these things, he's moving you away from practices that seem to in, to encourage a works righteous piety, and instead uh, point you to a righteousness outside of yourself. Those are sort of the the key yeah, shifts. Because all the law is going to do is continue to cloud the mirror. Well, yeah, and, and then there's other things too. There's the, you know, for Luther, it's not, the problem with penance initially isn't satisfaction. He already restarts, starts to rethink satisfaction as being, um, first of all, he thinks that the, the penalties which the indulgences have authority over is only satisfaction in, in the threefold thing. And satisfactions he sees as, as good works. There are three, three components to satisfaction is uh, uh, um, crucifixion of the flesh, uh, alms to the poor, and um, piety towards prayers toward God. So basically, Luther understands satisfaction as uh, the two tables of the law, right? Uh, your disposition towards God, your disposition towards others through almsgiving, and the crucifixion of your own flesh. Um, well, at that point, he just sees it as kind of the fruit of, of absolution. The problem is, what is absolution? Um, which is a whole nother, we'll, we'll get to that here shortly, but. Other, other questions or comments, uh, just on this uh, depiction of the context of these practices and what Luther's trying to do. All right, let me, let me dive into Luther a little bit then, uh, directly. Just a, a couple of things. <clears throat> Luther's actually not a pastor. In, in the narrow sense of the word. He's never, uh, he's, he's a, he is, uh, well, he, again, pastoral care is broader than just, you know, being a prediger. But um, here's sort of the, the points that matter. In 1505, Luther as a monk is ordained as a mass priest. So his job then is to perform the sacrifice of the mass for the brethren in the monastic community on their behalf. So that is a pastoral care component that's embedded deeply within the traditional um, aspects of pastoral care. In 1512, he's already at, at Wittenberg, uh, he is appointed as sub-prior of monastery, uh, which means he has now the responsibility to regularly preach to the monks uh, during, you have matins, but then you have a, a community service where there is after, after matins. Uh, in which uh, some kind of preaching happens usually. And so Luther is responsible for that. Um, then in 1514, he is appointed as assistant uh, to the pastor at St. Mary's in Wittenberg, uh, which means uh, he has some preaching and pastoral responsibilities assisting the main city pastor. He is never the city pastor. And of course, we know that Bugenhagen eventually becomes the city pastor. Luther is his assistant. He holds that position until his death. It's, it's married to his position as a professor. Um, uh, and of course, Bugenhagen travels a lot to spread the Reformation to Scandinavia, et cetera. So Luther fills in a lot. Um, uh, and he probably is kicking himself for the reform of worship that he did do because they didn't, uh, Luther didn't like the lectionary <clears throat> uh, very much. He wasn't a, a fan of the the structure of the historic lectionary, as you all say, um, especially the epistle, epistles he thought needed to be reformed, but he didn't have time. So he kept them, and he did the, the gospel on Sunday, did the epistle on um, Sunday afternoon, uh, and he spent a lot of time trying to reshape what epistle preaching should look like. But then he also did serial preaching. Um, so they established Wednesdays as the gospel of uh, Matthew, you know, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and Saturdays as the Gospel of John. 
Um, and so throughout his ministry, you have tons of sermons on Matthew and John because he's also filling in on this, this serial preaching. So at least four uh, Gottesdienst uh, per week, again, so that people would be taught taught from the scriptures. Just out of curiosity, because when Luther performs his first mass, you know, the big thing in the right. Luther film and Fine and his father comes and he yeah. shuts himself, you know, right, right. I mean, that, that whole thing. Where does it really fall in? Because it doesn't really, in the film, it doesn't fall in an understanding of a 1505 first mass. Yeah, it's 1505. Is that, that what be, it is? That is would that, be his that's first. That's what that's illustrating then exactly also right. in the film when, when uh, Stahlpitz gets him to go to Wittenberg and yeah, obviously there's a lot of conflation of time there. This is still there. being back at the monastery. This isn't it. This is an Erfurt, well. 1505. So it's after this then that Staupitz, yeah, so there's a lot, there's conflation there's, of... Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because the, the film really portrays that first Eucharist being done in Wittenberg, doesn't it? Uh, which so which film, the, by the way? The one thriving, you know, where Jacob Fine... Oh yeah, Joseph Fine, the brown-eyed, uh, cute... Yeah, right, right. Um, what, what do you say? Uh, uh, Voldemort's oh, brother. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. what you said. Good, well said. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I, okay. I, yeah, you're right, but it is, it's, Erf, it's the Erfurt Monastery. Okay, okay. well, that, that's good from a historian. I take your... Right. So he does not... Um, and then it's after that that Staupitz sort of deals with Luther and his scruples and then also forces him to do the doctoral studies at the University of Erfurt, which then is transferred to Wittenberg when he's transferred over there because, well, we'll talk about this, but Staupitz, Staupitz needs someone to fill that chair. So, And then, of course, uh, as we already mentioned, uh, the 1517 indulgence controversy is the, is the key uh, public effort of uh, where he gets embroiled in pastoral care issues. Um, let's see, 1050. So we still, are we okay? We go to 1130, is that right? Okay. Um, so here, here you've, you've, you've heard me mention this a couple of different times, and you and I had this exchange just now. Um, I want us to appreciate the fact that Luther is a monk. Um, how long is Luther a monk? What's he that? He served till his death. Pope tells him he's not. Well, you no, no. You asking, tell us. Are you asking when he when he when he took his monk clothes off? Well, that's pre that's a pretty good indicator because he doesn't. You know, he excommunicates the pope, right, and throws it in the fire. He continues to wear his habit. Um, uh, I mean, I think definitively when he gets married. Um, uh, so you know, you got you got pigtails on the pillow next to you and. That whole monastic life is done, right? He becomes a monk of a completely different order. What's that? Yeah, he just becomes a monk of a completely different order. Well, right, 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 right. Well, by that time, and that's that's kind of part of part of the point too. But um, you know, shortly before then, he does take off his 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 habit is thread thread barren, and instead of getting a new one, he just takes it off. And there's a couple of events which uh, lead to that, but it's 1524-25. So, so 1524-25, I mean, Luther is a monk in his own mind. He continues to psych call himself an Augustinian um, from this, through this entire period of time. Almost the, the majority of the great Reformation work, apart from the catechetical works, although all of that stuff is already in Sedes in the, in the early 20s, he does as a monk. And and uh, and this is important. Yes. Can you still be a monk after you're released from your vows? Didn't Staupitz release him? Staupitz released him from his vow of obedience. Right. So Staupitz is a superior, and he released him from his vow of obedience in in Augsburg because Luther needed to flee, and Staupitz was his needed to not be able to he needed to be free as well. They actually went in two different directions. Staupitz went to Salzburg and actually waited for Luther. He told Luther, come live with me and die with me. And Luther was going to until he got a letter the day before he left from Spalatin that said the Fre that Frederick will protect you. Come back. To he wants you back at the university. Um, so then Luther did, and he arrived on October 31st, 1518. Uh, 
as a reformer rather than a guy who's going to hang out with Staupitz. But, but Luther, I mean, the, remember, the, the vows, <laughs> the monastic identity uh, isn't just a legal, formal kind of thing. It's also, uh, even as they say, when you put the habit on, they say the habit doesn't make the monk, right? Um, it's an internal sort of thing. So Luther is relieved from his, his vow of obedience, but he still operates with, you know, he, he's on the faculty at University of Wittenberg. Do you know what his salary is? He's a monk. He's taking a vow of poverty. Frederick loves having monks on faculty. <laughs> they are so cheap. And so, so Luther's still under all those obligations, and he continues to practice daily offices, the Psalter once a week. I mean, he does that for the rest of his life in many ways. So there's certain facets of his monastic practice that never go away. So, so what did he get? I, I understand, maybe I'm wrong, but I understand that Luther occupied a chair of theology at the university that was, that was funded by Frederick. What did he get as a result of that? Nothing? What did... Who, who? Luther. As a monk, did he get nothing? Really nothing. Okay. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, because so there's, a, there's, a, there's a monastery in Wittenberg. So all of his... So what uh, the money that would normally go or any kind of salary that would normally go to an individual is rolled into uh, Frederick's caring for the monastery. So, and of course, Luther lives in that monastery and everybody leaves... And he's got this huge monastery, and Frederick just gives him the monastery for his house after it's all over. That's how long he's a monk. He's a monk until everybody stops being a monk and finally just kind of gets the monastery. The black oyster you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. The, the first, the first uh, St. Saint Louis uh, uh, Seminary. Ah, uh, yeah. So, um, remember, he is a monk. And uh, Staupitz, the, the University of Wittenberg is a new university. It was founded in 1502. And Staupitz was um, asked by Frederick to develop the theology faculty, both right at statutes and to bring in, the, bring in the, the key members of the faculty. And Staupitz wrote um, statutes in which said that, that uh, the patron saint of the theology faculty was St. Paul, the Tuba Evangelii, the, the trumpet of the gospel, and Augustine, St. Augustine. And, uh, and then he brought in a lot of universities uh, kind of focused in one theological direction or the other, whether it was Thomas Aquinas or William of Ockham, uh, the old way or the new way. Uh, Staupitz wanted representatives from each position. And he had chairs on each of them. He had someone that taught Don Scotus, someone taught Thomas Aquinas, someone William of Ockham. He f sat in the chair of William of Ockham until he was appointed vicar general, and then he needed someone to replace him. And that's the guy he selected to replace him. He made him do doctoral studies, and then he made him go to the University of Wittenberg, and Luther occupied the chair that Staupitz had under the nominalist uh, theology. Um, and a, a couple of things about Luther as a monk. Um, he's, an, he's an Augustinian, uh, which means he's not your regular, well, he's not a Benedictine monk. There's, there, there's, there's Benedictines and then there's mendicants. And the mendicants don't come along until the 12th and 13th century with, with uh, uh, Francis and then Dominic. Um, so St. Francis of Assisi and the Franciscans are your first mendicant order. What's the difference? You know what the difference is between mendicants and monks T on a technical level? The monks are cloistered and mendicants are beggar monks. So whereas monks move away from society to the fringes of society and get cloistered out away from the world, mendicants often position themselves within the center of worldly activity in the cities and are beggars they are not to be cloistered. Of course, this doesn't last long. Uh, Francis dies and they immediately want to build a cloister to put his body in it. <laughs> um, but <clears throat> the idea, um, you, you have a different orientation to society if you're a mendicant. The mendicants became famous preachers. They became, they interacted with the laity in a way that monks didn't. They were interested in education. 
and in catechesis and in preaching. Of course, the, the Dominicans are called the order of preachers, right? That's sort of their, they, they are battle against heresy, but also the cultivation of piety. Augustinians, from the beginning, had a sense in which they were going to, um, they were going to extend their piety to all laity, and they were going to do it primarily through preaching and catechesis. And the Augustinians, like many people, but the Augustinians were very clear about this, they talked a lot about Reformation. For centuries, they talked about reform. And reforming first began with their own order and then would extend to all people. Um, the, the, uh, the prior general of the order, Giles of Viterbo, in Luther's day, who was in Rome, constantly wrote about Reformation. Um, Staupitz, his vicar general, constantly talked about Reformation, and it had to do a lot with um, educating and preaching. Now, Luther is a monk in a, in a university, and there's a lot of different ways in which to conduct oneself as a, a doctor of theology. Um, and if we have time, we can talk about those various ways. But Luther brings his monastic piety into the classroom. So that the central text for his lectures are not systematic theology texts, but are biblical texts. And he begins with the central text of his monastic piety, which is the Psalter. He spends from 1513 to 1515 lecturing on the Psalms. Um, to sign up for that class, I know you're going to be stuck for two years uh, with one prof. It probably would have been disappointing. But he, his first lectures were on the text that he had already memorized, the Psalter. But then he goes, of course, to Romans in 1515 to 1516, and then Galatians in 16 to 17, and Hebrews 17 to 18. And after he's finished with Romans, which is a huge shift in his thinking, I, I, without getting all into the details, I'll just tell you, between his lectures on the Psalms and the lectures on Romans, uh, essentially Luther gets all of the key components that he needs to, to be evangelical. To, to understand the gospel, especially what John was talking about, the distinction of law and gospel is, is, uh, is happens in the Romans lectures. Um, at the end of it, he writes a letter to Spalatin about Erasmus because Erasmus had just published his Greek New Testament in 1516 and Luther got it as soon as it was off the press and started using it in his Romans lectures. So he had read Erasmus thoroughly and Spalatin, who was Frederick's secretary and Luther's friend from college, um, was also a correspondent of Erasmus, who was the most famous academic in Europe. And Luther says, I don't, you know, he doesn't know who I am, but I'd like you to pass on to him that I think uh, that he doesn't understand Paul. Uh, this great academic like doesn't understand what the law is, and he doesn't understand what sin is, according to Paul. And he says he really should read more Augustine. And, uh, and he says, in fact, if you, if you really want to understand Paul, you should read Augustine's Antipelagian writings. It's volume 8 of the new edition. Tell him. Um, and then at the end, he says, I know that uh, I'm just this monk that nobody cares about, and he's this prince of humanist, and I have no business talking, but I can't help myself because this is pro re theologica et salute fratrum, because this is for the sake of theology and the salvation of the brethren. And this gets at your point, too. So look at this. Theology and salvation are, are held together. He wants to revise uh, what happens in the classroom in terms of lecturing on Paul, but that will have, a, it's not just um, an interesting exegetical debate, right? Um, but it's something that touches upon not only the heart of theology, but the heart of theology's effect on the salvation of the brethren. What year was this? 1516. 1516. And of course, he still signs it as Fratre Martinus Luder Augustinianus, Brother Martin Luther. Augustinian. And even after the 95 Theses, he continues to sign his name Augustinian. Um, he changes his name from Luther to Luther uh, on October 31st, 1517. This is the first time he signs his name, T-H-E-R. Uh, yeah? Yeah, what's up with that? Uh, <laughs> Uh, and, then, and then shortly afterwards, he starts playing around with uh, Luther and Eloiterius, 
right? He starts signing his name with a Greek, a Latinized form of the Greek word for freedom. And so the, the looter kind of just means like dirt. Um, and, and so, uh, you know, just like, just like Melanchthon, Mr. Schwartz ad, uh, you know, spruces up his name by making it uh, into Greek. Luther, of course, is influenced by humanism as well. So he's playing around with that language. And so, I, but, but he, he, he calls himself the free one, right? And he does this, he first begins to explore that with his, with the changing the spelling of his name. And then he even goes a little bit further and signs his name, Martinus Eleutherius Augustinianus. Uh, he's still an Augustinian. Um, so, uh, uh, so, but, but what's interesting is that, uh, remember I, t I talked about this fratrum stuff, this brethren, and he's, he is, he is, who is the brethren to whom he is trying to change theology? For whom is he trying to shape? And it's, it's, uh, it's the cloister, but it's more, it's pushing out the edges. And he's starting to see, in many ways, the way in which the Augustinians have been arguing for a couple of centuries, that, um, that to be religious is more than just wearing the habit. To be religious is to uh, believe the things the monks believe, and you don't have to be a monk to believe those things. And so this pushing out of the boundaries of monasticism out into the world uh, is something that's there. Remember, being religious, um, is a, a technical term in the Middle Ages. I mean, we talk, you hear people say uh, today, I, I'm, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, which just means I, I, I believe in crystals, um, but I don't go to church. Um, but being religious in the Middle Ages is very, very specific. It means you have taken the three monastic vows. Um, that's why you can have religious priests and secular priests in the Middle Ages. Uh, it's not like one group of people who love God and the other people like don't. Um, it's someone who's ordained as a priest who has also taken monastic vows as a religious priest. Someone who hasn't taken monastic vows uh, is a secular priest. Um, so to be religious, so this does a couple of things. It's a technical phrase, but it also um, promotes a particular theology that the standard for spiritual, the spiritual life, the standard for Christian life, the religious life, is what monks do and look like. Right? So the, the famous passage where Jesus confronts the rich man and the rich young man comes to him and says, what must I do to enter the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus says, well, you know the commandments. You don't do those. And he says, well, I've done all of those since I was a child. And so then uh, Jesus says, well, one thing you lack, if you would be perfect, uh, sell all you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Well, that's an interesting passage. Uh, St. Anthony heard that passage and thought, oh, to be a Christian means to sell all you have, give to the poor, and follow Christ into the desert, right? Right? Um, is that text making a claim on all Christians? And monks and would, would say yes, but the broader church would say, well, no, can't expect everybody to sell all they have and give to the poor. Especially if you look at the Pope's coffers, it doesn't seem right. Same problem came with Saint, when St. Saint Francis came on the scene and said, to be an apostle and to be a disciple of Jesus, you have to own absolutely nothing. Uh, and again, this is at the height of papal power, Innocent III. And they're like, really? I mean, is that, can you be a disciple without renouncing all of your wealth? Um, and <clears throat> so the best way to deal with that is that you actually describe a two-tier Christianity. You have, you have your regular folk who enter the kingdom of heaven by obeying the Ten Commandments. But then those who would be perfect follow what is called the evangelical councils. Uh, basically, the central tenets of the Sermon on the Mount are seen as advice for those who wish to be more spiritual or religious. Um, so you have this two-tier Christianity. And um, what happens is, as laity are searching outside of the sacramental system for more avenues of spiritual growth and consolation, the only standard that's laid out before them is the monastic life. 
And so you see, in the late Middle Ages, this movement called the Modern Devotion, or the Devotio Moderna, <clears throat> in which people imitate monks without becoming monks. Married folk take vows of celibacy within their marriage. Um, people gather together and live in communes without taking vows of obedience, like the Brethren of Common Life, and they read scripture on a regular daily basis. Or they, they grab hold of uh, the Book of Hours, which is a layperson's version of the monastic daily office. Right? So they, they imitate it. And, <clears throat> and as you know, Luther, what Luther does with the priesthood, he does with monasticism, what it means to be religious too. That it's not the vows that make one religious, it's the word of Christ that makes one religious. And suddenly all of these standards and ideals that are limited by the monastic cloister are, are spread out and are applied to everyone. <clears throat> um, Staupitz was a key uh, player early on for Luther. Luther says the whole thing happened because of Staupitz. Staupitz gave him the gospel. This whole movement's his. Um, and while there's a bit of hyperbole there, I don't think we can skip over that too quickly. In what sense is Staupitz, his monastic abbot, his monastic supervisor and, and uh, personal spiritual counselor, the father or forerunner of the Reformation? By the way, the phrase forerunner Reformation is a quote of Staupitz describing himself. So Staupitz himself sees himself as a forerunner of the evangelical movement. Um, but he is, <clears throat> he is a, a very popular preacher and an architect of much of the Augustinian reform movement, which is really encapsulated in what one scholar calls Frömmigkeitstheologie. Um, uh, Bernd Ham calls it fr what, a theology of piety. Essentially, the, what he's trying to describe with this long German word, which somehow helps, I don't know how, but... Um, Look in German it does. Yeah, in German it helps, and it just it just means that um, there is there is a, a a theological trajectory to the kind of piety that's being encouraged and inculcated in the late Middle Ages, and it causes a crisis. It's got two poles that pull on one another. One is uh, what some have called a theology of humility. Uh, and this is very much the monastic piety where uh, one is, uh, as, as the monks would say, semper penitens, always a penitent. No matter how much <clears throat> you accomplish, no matter what good you do, you must always recognize that uh, there are imperfections along the way. No matter how much you advance, you must always, you don't look back to see how, much you've, how far you've come, but always recognize you have much further to go. And so the life of a monk <clears throat> and this larger theology of humility that's um, taught by the monastic community is that you must never live without confessing your sin. You must never live as if you are independent <clears throat> from God, but that you're, everything that you have is a gift from God and everything you need going forward comes from God. It's an important theme. On the other hand... There's a strong emphasis on purity and perfection to try to continue to live according to the Sermon on the Mount, live according to the ideals of the commandments. Um, and so you have this, on the one hand, you're, you're trying to examine yourself very closely and highlight all the ways in which your motivations in life are imperfect. And on the other hand, you have this standard of perfection, um, this standard of righteousness by which you will be measured on the last day, so there's, this, there's this eschatological urgency to this. And that it's in the middle of that tension is where Luther sits. Because unlike a lot of other people, he takes both poles as seriously as one can. As he says later in life, if there was anyone that could gain salvation by being a monk, I would have done it. I was a monk of monks. And his experience of being a penitent was the crisis for him. He would, he would go into the, uh, to confess his sins. And of course, the, the way penitence works is you have to confess them all 
And if you confess them, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And the priest then, as a priest in the style of the Levitical priesthood, examines you. And if you are clean through the confession of your sin, he will declare you to be clean, which is what absolution is. So Luther would go and get the declaration, he'd leave, and he would experience his sin is still present. I must have forgotten to, to confess something. He goes back. Um, or perhaps he leaves and he feels clean, but he feels kind of proud about that. Oh no, that's pride. Go back. <laughs> and the, the problem is he leaves the sacrament of penance with the very palpable experience that though the priest has said his sin is removed, his sin remains. And there's only two possibilities for that. One is, he hasn't confessed enough. Or two, he's predestined to hell and the sacrament doesn't work. And that's where he sits when he comes to Staupitz. And fortunately, Staupitz has preached a series of sermons on the doctrine of election because other people have had this problem too. And Staupitz's advice is, stop thinking about the God who predestines. <laughs> but think about Christ. Um, the, the central person in, the, in penance is the crucified one. And you see that scene in a variety of, of, uh, of the Luther movies. The best one actually is the Joseph Fiennes movie on that point, where Staupitz shows him the cross. And, and Luther sees that moment for whatever, I mean, it's a simple point, right? But why, however it clicks for him, Luther realizes he has to move his entire way thinking from the God who has set up the system in which he experiences sin to the Christ who makes a promise to him uh, about where his sin is, actually is. And so Luther comes to the understanding that the removal of sin is not something that is experienced, but something that's believed. <clears throat> Questions, so that's yeah. the so that's the moment at which we stop being uh, stop walking down the Calvinist path and start walking down the Lutheran path. Uh, stop looking at that election. Oh, yeah, because Calvin came later, so it's hard for me to figure. Out. Uh, um, uh, well, the doctrine of election is is an issue in late medieval theology. Um, to such an extent that the way to resolve it was with some form of semi-Pelagianism. Um, uh, the big crisis, pastoral crisis, in, in medieval theology is whether or not um, God is faithful to his promises if you, don't, if you experience the opposite. And the solution to that problem was uh, this assertion. God is gracious even if you don't experience it, as long as you try hard, God will still give you grace. Um, so it's a semi-Pelagian argument, but it's a, it's a pastoral one to try to deal with the problem of election. Luther doesn't buy it. Um, and so he realizes he's, he's either, he can't be a Pelagian because he's an Augustinian. Um, uh, so he's maybe an atheist. Uh, he's not an atheist. He believes in God. He just hates him. Um, so for Luther, the only option is to eventually become a Lutheran, I think. Other, other questions or comments just so far? This is, I know this is kind of getting the background, but I want you to get sort of the monastic tendency of Luther's thought. There's, an, there's another aspect to it, and, I, and um, I don't want to enter into it yet because it'll take a little time. Um, but it deals with how Luther understands, man, applies this theology of humility that I talked about to his understanding of law and gospel. Questions or comments? I know it's a lot of material. Yeah. Can, can you, I, I kind of missed it when you first went through it. What happened to Luther himself uh, when he was, when he uh, finally at the end of what is writing writing on uh, his commentaries on, on uh, Romans came out the other end. What, what was the result? Yeah, let's, let's talk about that a bit. Um, that's worth, and we can go to 1130, right? We have 15 minutes, okay. Um, <clears throat> first of all, Luther didn't publish a commentary on Romans, right? I mean, he lectured, I think, to more people than this, but not a whole, bu not a whole bunch more. <clears throat> 
and actually, uh, nobody actually examined Luther's uh, lectures on Romans until the 20th century. We didn't have it. We lost it. We knew he lectured on Romans. Nobody read it. Where um, were they? Uh, well, that's an interesting story, too. Um, what happened is this Roman Catholic uh, theologian, uh, Heinrich de Niefle, who's a Dominican theologian, wrote a three-volume uh, uh, treatise on Luther and Lutheranism, you know, just going after Luther as tr traditional Roman Catholics did. But he was a scholar, a medieval scholastic scholar, and he found in the Vatican Library a, col a copy of a set of student notes from Luther's Romans lectures. Uh, you know, so how did he get in the Vatican? Well, you got 30s year wars and all kinds of stuff like that. But <clears throat> there's a, there was a copy in the late 19th century of somebody's notes from, that sat in Luther's class. And he used that then to examine that in light of Luther's end of life reflection on his breakthrough to show that Luther was, um, well, not a heretic, a liar and maybe senile. In other words, the common interpretation of the 1545 reflection on Luther's gospel breakthrough is that it happened in 1519. Um, that righteousness was passive, all that kind of stuff. And then he goes to the Romans lectures, according to these notes, it's all there in the Romans lectures in 1515 and 1516. Um, so anyway, he uses it to exploit. Anyway, everybody goes crazy. They start scouring all the, and you know where they find, they, they not only find an other sets of student notes, they find Luther's handwritten preparations for the lectures. In the Vatican. Nope. Bound in red leather behind a glass case in the library of the University of Berlin. <laughs> that was hard to find. They didn't even know. <laughs> that they had it. It was just there. And they just, his son had it bound. Luther's son had it bound. It was never published. So, but what happens? <clears throat> Uh, the big thing that happens is Luther reads Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings. And he realizes that uh, the way that medieval theology has interpreted Paul by using Aristotle's philosophy, etc., has actually, has actually taken Paul into a Pelagian direction. It's great irony here. And so he looks at Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings, who gives you a much clearer reading of, of Paul, and it's in that context that Luther really discovers the distinction of long gospel as we know it. To tell that story is a long story, and I'm not going to tell it. But, <clears throat> but, but Luther essentially comes to an understanding of a, of a sharp distinction of long gospel that nobody really shared in the Middle Ages that's kind of at the heart of the problem of justification. <clears throat> and actually, uh, nobody actually examined Luther's uh, lectures on Romans until the 20th century. We didn't have it. We lost it. We knew he lectured on Romans. Nobody read it. Where uh, were they? Uh, well, that's an interesting story, too. Um, what happened is this Roman Catholic uh, theologian, uh, Heinrich de Niefle, who's a Dominican theologian, wrote a three-volume uh, uh, treatise on Luther and Lutheranism, you know, just going after Luther as tr traditional Roman Catholics did. But he was a scholar, a medieval scholastic scholar, and he found in the Vatican Library a, col a copy of a set of student notes from Luther's Romans lectures. Uh, you know, so how did he get in the Vatican? Well, you got 30s year wars and all kinds of stuff like that. But <clears throat> there's a, there was a copy in the late 19th century of somebody's notes from, that sat in Luther's class. And he used that then to examine that in light of Luther's end of life reflection on his breakthrough to show that Luther was, um, well, not a heretic, a liar and maybe senile. In other words, the common interpretation of the 1545 reflection on Luther's gospel breakthrough is that it happened in 1519, um, that righteousness was passive, all that kind of stuff. And then he goes to the Romans lectures, according to these notes, it's all there in the Romans lectures in 1515 and 1516. Um, so anyway, he uses it to exploit. Anyway, everybody goes crazy. They start scouring all the, and you know where they find, they, they not only find an other sets of student notes, they find Luther's handwritten preparations for the lectures. In the Vatican. Nope. Bound in red leather behind a glass case in the library of the University of Berlin. <laughs> that was hard to find. 
They didn't even know that they had it. It was just there, and they just. His son had it bound. Luther's son had it bound. It was never published. So, but what happens? <clears throat> Uh, the big thing that happens is Luther reads Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings. And he realizes that uh, the way that medieval theology has interpreted Paul by using Aristotle's <laughs> philosophy, etc., has actually, has actually taken Paul into a Pelagian direction. It's great irony here. And so he looks at Augustine's anti-Pelagian writings, who gives you a much clearer reading of, of Paul, and it's in that context that Luther really discovers the distinction of long gospel as we know it. To tell that story is a long story, and I'm not going to tell it. But, <clears throat> but, but Luther essentially comes to an understanding of a, of a sharp distinction of long gospel that nobody really shared in the Middle Ages that's kind of at the heart of the problem of justification. And this is pre-1517. Yes, this is in the Romans lectures, which is 1515 to 1516. You see it all there. <clears throat> Could you back up and repeat once again? And you, you, you don't have to explain how this all came about, law and gospel, but, but did you say it was based upon his reading of Augustine and his writings of Romans? Right. Uh, his writings, uh, his anti Pelagian writings, which, but the anti Pelagian writings, largely it's Romans and Galatians that are the key texts against Pelagius that are being dealt with. Um, uh, and if you remember the, that 1545 account of his breakthrough, he says, when he discovers the the righteousness of God is passive, not active. And he says, and then I read Augustine on the spirit and the letter, and I found hope beyond hope. It was in there too. See? So <clears throat> when you actually read what's going on in his lectures, that you, you, it's all there. It's clearly all there. <clears throat> There's another aspect to it that I'll, I'll talk about on the far end of the break, and that is not just Augustine, but um, uh, German mystics uh, actually are, are, are part of the key. Uh, for him to kind of get a sense of the gospel. Um, but we'll, I'll, I'll describe that. But that's what happens in, and of course, it's not published. It doesn't change anybody's mind, except in the university. Because what he does in the classroom becomes public. Somebody blogs about it uh, on the internet. No, there's, there's a disputation um, by one of his students who was in the class. And the disputation is basically Luther's theology in his Romans lectures, now in front of the entire faculty. And the entire faculty goes, what? And of course, they don't care about the student. They know Luther's behind it. And they say, what in the? And so there's this huge debate. Karl Stott goes crazy. Everybody goes crazy. And Luther says, just go read Augustine. And so Karl Stott grabs Augustine, volume eight, you know, starts reading through. And by the time he's at the end, he converts to Luther's cause. And he gives a, a Nicholas Amsdorf, another guy, says, what? I hear some stuff going on. I mean, he's at, he's at uh, Erlangen at the time. He says, I, I hear strange things happening. He says, here, take a volume of, uh, read Augustine. He reads Augustine. He's converted to Luther's cause. In, in, in a short time, <clears throat> by the time you get to early 1517, before the 95 Theses, Luther is writing to colleagues at Erfurt saying, our theology in St. Augustine's is gaining ground. It's winning the day at the university. So by the time the 95 Theses come out, the whole faculty is on Luther's side, pretty much. It's a Wittenberg theology that's already starting to happen. But again, this is all kind of... So the indul uh, indulgences were just, just sort of like a side note. Com it's a pe exactly compared to what was actually happening within the academia itself. Yeah. Well, in September 1517, Luther writes 97 theses against scholastic theology. Devastating. It's, it takes everything he did with Romans and he just blows up theology. He has great lines. He, the, remember the beginning of that set of disputations? If Augustine is exaggerating in his Antipelagian writings, he's exaggerating everywhere and not to be trusted. So he, start, he leads with Augustine. And then by the end, he's like saying, Aristotle is to theology as darkness is to light. And he just reshapes in 97 Theses the entire theological paradigm based on his reading of Paul. And, uh, and he, send, he prints it, and he sends it out. Crickets. So what happened to, to Nobody history? says anything. And then one month later, kaboom, on 95. Yeah. What happened? Money. What, what happened to, I, I'm, I'm, I'm criticizing, I'm, I'm now po yeah. focusing on the, the, the role of the, the, the uh, historian right. in the last 500 years. Why, why has history been written in such a way that this, this is the first time I, a Lutheran, have heard about this, you know, this, this, um, this larger controversy? Uh, because, well, um, 
it's, that's a whole other discussion why scholarship has gone in one direction. One of the reasons why is these early writings of Luther are difficult writings. You can't just enter in them, even with like good Lutheran education, enter into them and really understand what you're reading. You'll read in your Lutheran theology into stuff that isn't quite there yet, and you have to read, you have to read stuff before to get into it. So it's hard work to get to that point. Um, but there's other reasons, too, why it's been ignored. Yeah. Has that, has, does that have anything to do with the, with the, um, the larger Protestant uh, church, where the Calvinists don't like this kind of stuff? It doesn't help their cause that much, does it? No. I mean, I think when you read this stuff, you start to realize, and why I'm emphasizing the, the monastic side of things, is, okay, you're not going to like this. Maybe you will. Um, what I understand Lutheranism to be is not a self-referential theological system. It is a movement of pastoral care. It is a theological critique of theology that, that doesn't end in pastoral care. If you look at the Book of Concord, it is not a, and it intended to be a systematic theology or address every aspect of theology. It is oriented towards confessing things that have, uh, that have effect on someone's individual faith. I mean, look at, why are they status controversiae? Their status controversiae is because of what it does to, to, to consolation of consciences, right? Again and again. Um, it's not just trying to preserve a doctrine for its own sake. It's aimed at something. And Luther's, because uh, uh, Luther's, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't try to fix everything. He's just trying to, it's fine as long as it aims at the gospel and it aims at faith. To what end? Yeah, to what end? Yeah, what's, that's the goal. In other words, we're, we're trying to make sure that um, I see. So it doesn't, it doesn't fit the Protestant narrative that Lutheranism is a divorce from a church and it's the pro, you know, so it, Luther is embedded within a larger Catholic structure um, that he never, I mean, he sees the Pope as leaving that Catholic structure. That's a whole other issue. Um, but uh, uh, the, his theological approach and the theological approach of the, of the confessors um, is aimed primarily at pastoral care, not at creating its own self-referential system. That, that's what I call practical. He's looking at the end user, meaning the, the, the layperson, the Christian, yep. how we're going to get this, this so booted in between the, uh, the, you know, the uprights of the pearly gates. No, that's right. The, I mean, the mantra is, the point of the Reformation is that all people might be taught of God. And it happens through the scriptures. And so anything that can get the scriptures into the hearts and the minds and the ears and in the mouths of, of people, that's, that's fine. That's what the Reformation is going to do. And the Calvinists did a lot of that too, but they had other goals in mind as well. So. For, the, for them, I think acad academia meant a lot more than it did to Luther. Yeah. Or the in institution of the church itself. I'm talking about the, the visible church, not, not the church uh, Catholic. Yeah, I mean, we can come back to that. You know. uh, in that sense, that's the real, I think, rev if you want to put it, revolutionary part of Luther, in that he divorces these hallowed sacred cows. And he's yeah. saying the I'm people are, the getting people into heaven is our, you know, is our, our, our us. That's yeah. what we do. Zondervan uh, has got a dogmatic series. They asked me to write the book on, a, on the ch doctrine of the church. And I laughed and I said, you know, we're Lutherans. We don't, we really don't have an ecclesiology. You know, I mean, uh, <clears throat> but um, what, what do I mean by that? In other words, we're, we're not, you know, ecclesiologies are more political structures than they are about the shepherd and the voice of the shepherd and those who hear the voice. 